What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Collider Interview Studio at Fantastic Fest 2023. We are talking about a Stephen King adaptation right now. It is Pet Cemetery Bloodlines with filmmaker Lindsay Anderson Beer. Hello and congratulations. Thank you so much. So nice to meet you. I love Stephen King. I love Pet Cemetery. But first, I want to make sure our audience gets to learn a little bit more about you. Yeah. I was looking up that you studied neuroscience and intersection of technology and society at Sanford. I had to write that down to be able to repeat it. What inspired you to study that? And then what inspired the shift of filmmaking? I always wanted to be a filmmaker. I was one of those annoying kids who was like always oh, just turning in a movie instead of an essay or something for school projects. I respect that <laughs> greatly. Um, but I always, I loved horror and science fiction, and I just felt like studying something in related to, to science could just be such an interesting backdrop and stuff to mine for my career later. So you decide you want to pursue filmmaking full force. When that happened, what would you say was the key to bridging the gap for identifying the dream and making it happen? Because I feel like I heard your name for the first time on something and then all of a sudden I heard it on a million things and you really got going very quickly. I work uh, like 18 to 20 hours a day. <laughs> um, if I decide to do something, I really, really do it. And I moved here and I just never stopped working and um, just try it. really gave it my all. And when I think that's all you can do if you love something and you just throw yourself at it and have no regrets. This particular business, I feel like that's the only mentality you can have if you're yeah. going to jump into it. Yeah. So you've been you've been writing and producing, but yeah. this marks your feature directorial debut. Yeah. Selecting the right material is the utmost importance for of something course. like that. So why particularly Pet Cemetery Bloodlines? What did you think it was about that material that aligned with the skills you already had and would maybe help you take those skills to the next level? Yeah, it's a great question. There was so much about it. I mean, first of all, Pet Cemetery was my favorite King book um, when I was a kid. So that was a little bit of a, a, a dream project. But specifically as a filmmaker, I felt like um, even more so than all of King's work, which happens to like be, a, it's often a mishmash of genres, right? Like there's a much more human element to it than a lot of horror writers. But Pet Cemetery particularly is kind of a backdoor horror movie. It's a family drama that becomes incredibly terrifying. And I felt like that universe where you could make a drama that just happens to be really fucking terrifying and in doing so also kind of employ all of the filmmakers kind of toolkits in a way that you don't necessarily have to in other genres and specifically for this project, Pet Cemetery is so much about confronting death. And I thought about things like the silence of death and the sound design that I could use. And it, my mind just kind of started turning immediately about how I could use all the different aspects I love of filmmaking. And I also, I love 60s music and that kind of hooked me too. There were just so many elements that I felt like I could really dig into the different areas of filmmaking that I love for this particular movie. So now to build on that a little, yeah. is there anything about your experience making Pet Cemetery that signals to you that in order to hone those skills even further, Sleepy Hollow would be the next best <laughs> film to make. Sleepy Hollow, you know, there are a lot of skill sets that are, are similar in terms of its beloved IP. It's also the, the same kind of thing where when I was doing Bloodlines, I kept asking myself when I was doing the rewrites, what would I want to know as a, as a Pet Cemetery fan? What are the questions left unanswered from the book? And what are the parts of the book that haven't been explored in movies? Like, you know, for instance, um, the end of the book says that Judd is the guardian of the woods. And, and um, the book says that Judd's experience with Timmy Baderman is the reason that the evil's even targeting him as an old man that we know. So there are so many things like that that aren't explored in films and that a lot, a lot of the fans don't know because they haven't read the book or haven't read the book in the same t for so much time. Sleepy Hollow, same thing. Like the legends of Sleepy Hollow are so rich. And as I started doing um, research about the Hudson Valley and true ghost stories, I just, I got addicted to that too. That's like the best possible answer right there. Um, you brought up the rewrites you did on the script. Can yeah. you tell me a little bit about what you really embraced in Jeff's version of the screenplay and then what you thought you could bring out of his vision to, you know, enhance it, but also make it purely your own? Yeah, um, you know, 
directing is such a personal endeavor. So of course, you know, even if a script is amazing, when you come on as a writer director, you kind of have to make it your own. So um, the the stuff that I really responded to in Jeff's material was just the, the bones of the story in terms of a Timmy Baderman story being the lens through which you explore an origin story um, and centering that around Judd. And when I came on, um, it, it was, it was such a, it was, he had written such a fun slasher movie. Um, but I wanted to return it more to the tone of the book in terms of, um, the mix of genres, the, the drama, the comedy, the, the make, I want, my goal was to make it really brutal and raw and scary as shit, but also hopefully have a lot of human moments. So just tonally, that was a focus of the rewrites, but, um, just the there are a lot of new characters that I brought in and um, particularly the character of Donna and 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 Manny are so important to me. He, there was a version of Manny in Jeff's script, but he was a little bit more of the um, kind of comedic sidekick. Was there no Donna in that? There version? was no Donna. No. I can't imagine the character of, of <laughs> Manny without that connection to Donna. Now, yeah, there was a character named Donna, <laughs> but who wasn't Donna? He oh. she was just like a, she was like a um, she was a uh, yeah, a part a party girl, but not but not Manny's sister, not Native American. Um, but um, I, one of the things I like to do when I'm rewriting somebody is change as little as possible. If so, I kept the name the same, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, repurposed the the character, and um, I just I thought that that relationship between the two of them was so central to my my version of the movie that I wanted to make. And also just giving Native Americans more of a point of view in the movie, just given the history of kind of mystical indigenous and the trope of the cursed land that was associated with the property before. I felt like I wanted to refresh that mythology, show that, you know, what we know about Pet Cemetery and the curse is actually not what it is. And that there's a lot more to discover. And the story we know is either an explicit cover up or it's just superstitions or, you know, whatever it is. And to be able to do that correctly, I felt like we needed one, I thought Manny needed to be an equal hero with Judd. And two, I thought we needed a, a, also a, a, a female Native American perspective as well as a male. Not easy to add new characters to yeah. a, a beloved book adaptation. I thought yeah. you did that especially well here. Having seen the film, I can kind of answer this question myself, I think. But I am curious from your perspective, having gone through this experience making the movie, because we have many Stephen King adaptations out yeah. there. Many of them are absolutely phenomenal. So, some, you know, people people want a little something else than what they got. So yeah. having done this movie, what is one do for adapting a Stephen King novel? And what is one do not that you would recommend to another filmmaker about to adapt some of his work? You know, I I adapt a lot of IP because that's the business we are in, you know, these days. And I always approach it the same way, which is that you have to honor the spirit of what the original thing was. And to me, the spirit is like the theme or the moral question. So, you know, for Pet Cemetery, even though this is a very different kind of film than some of the other Pet Cemeteries and isn't just a, a small family drama, but examines a whole town. Um, that central question of what would you do for somebody you love is is central to the the kind of core of the story and where the horror comes from and where the comedy comes from and uh, where the drama comes from. And so I would say do lean into what made that property that property. What is that essential question or essence to that thing? Um, I would say that don't is a don't is an, is, is an interesting question. I would say don't just do something to remake it. You know, it has to stand on its own. It has to have a reason for being. I definitely can get behind that. One of the things that kept sticking out to me about your particular film is I, I just love the idea of finding a little corner that is hinted at, but not fully explored. And I think there's so much opportunity, like especially with Stephen King's work, where it is so incredibly rich, full and detailed. Yeah. I mean, really just about everything he's ever written. I feel like there is some sort of hidden area somewhere that we've yeah. at least heard a line or maybe a chapter about that is well worth its own full story. Oh, for sure. And I mean, the Timmy Baderman story could be its own full story, even if it wasn't a, an origin story that told more about the founding of, of Ludlow. It, and and that to me, I was trying to 
bridge the intimacy of the Timmy story with kind of the the scope of an origin story for Ludlow and not just Judd. I have one more do do not question for yeah. you because I love hearing about working with animals and yeah. that was one of my favorite things to talk about on the 2019 uh, yeah, Pet yeah. Cemetery movie. What is one do and one do not for working with a dog actor? Oh, um, <laughs> do not. Um, uh, block off long periods to work with them because they tire very easily, unfortunately, and you got to be kind to your animals. Um, do go into it with an open mind. I was told how awful it is to work with animals, and I had a delightful experience with all of my animals. It was uh, definitely a number one film school rule: do not work, with, do not work with babies, and do not work with animals. <laughs> yeah, but I love animals. And yeah, I do too. The, I know there were three dog there actors were three dogs. here. Phenomenal work for all of them. Yeah. To highlight some more of your cast here, I always love asking a question like this. Of all the roles in this ensemble, which was the easiest to cast, where it was like the right person just magically appeared? But then of the bunch, who was which character was the most difficult to find the perfect fit for? Um, Manny was the easiest to cast. I uh, Forrest I, is the best. I just knew I wanted <laughs> Forrest, and I offered it to him. <laughs> so I, don't, that was, I do not blame you one bit. <laughs> that, that was uh, very very easy to cast. I mean, all the other younger roles, I watched a shit ton of tapes. Um, and uh, But the older roles um, for Duchovny, Greer, Henry Thomas, Samantha Mathis, those were those were actually very easy in that they all came to mind first and I was lucky enough to get my first choices. So another thing I love talking about is uh, very bloody movie magic. Yeah. It is it is an artistry that I think needs even more credit than it often gets. Oh yeah, definitely. Of everything you filmed in that respect on this movie, is there anything that above all else made you go like, my God, I cannot believe that that is what it takes to make it look like that on screen in the finished product? Oh, that's such a good question. Hmm. Um, and there's nothing that surprised me really, but I completely agree with you. There's so much like craft and artistry on so many different levels that goes into this between uh, the people who make the prosthetics, the angles you choose to film things from. I think even more than any other genre, it's so, so key what angles you're showing when and why, because something becomes scary or not scary, depending on on, on which way you're showing it. Um, the the foot scene is so was so fun to film. <laughs> it's a good example right there. Good yeah. example. It's a nice tease. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it was a really good one. And that I, I mostly tried to do practical effects, but that was one where it was practical enhanced by CG. I feel like yeah. um, both practical and digital are, yeah. are beautiful arts, and when yeah, they're yeah. both used well together, yeah. that yeah, yeah. is just always the pitch perfect combination when yeah, you can. For sure. I'm gonna get greedy right now. Um, now that you've done one Stephen King adaptation if yeah. you had the opportunity to adapt another one of his works which one would you pick and why I really it that would be like choosing favorite children I don't I I, I, <laughs> I love asking questions that are I, formatted like I, choosing a paper I, child I, yeah, I, uh, yeah I'm sure anybody who actually has a child which does not mean it's like no that is not at all like choosing a favorite child um uh but um there are so many I, I love and I would really have to, I don't know that there's any that stands out right now that I'm like, I don't feel like it's been done well, or I don't feel, I feel, I feel like there's like this whole missing chapter, the way that I felt about Pet Cemetery, um, where I felt there, there was truly this chapter that hadn't been told that I was excited to contribute. I'm just trying to speak this into existence because yeah. I know it existed and fell apart, but I want a long walk movie. Yes. So Badly, so badly. Okay, let's put that into the okay. universe. I'm just speaking it. We manifest things here. Okay. Everyone knows. Yeah. Now I'm going to do the obnoxious thing and ask you about maybe one or two upcoming titles. Yeah. So you already brought up that you adapt a lot of IP. And I feel like it could be a similar approach to something like this. But I am very curious with something like Bambi. Because we're yeah. often talking about with the uh, the live action uh, yeah. adaptations. Like I guess the question often is, like, why? Why do we need another one? So going back to how you describe Pet Cemetery, what is something about the classic version of Bambi that you think is important to hold tight to? But then also, how are you going to answer the question of why? Why do we need a new version? Yeah, well, what's interesting about 
Bambi to me is it absolutely is a classic and it's a, like it's a beautiful love poem, such uh, artistry to it. I do think there's an entire generation of children who have never seen the original. And that's very different from, say, Little Mermaid or Aladdin or the, you know, the the 90s heyday films that they've definitely already seen. I can't tell you how many kids I, I've seen who, who've never seen Bambi, which is such a shame. And the thing is, it's such a gorgeous film. It's a little bit different tempo than I think um, modern audiences are used to. And I also think there's a there's there's a treatment of the the not to spoil the plot but there's a there's a there's a treatment of the mom dying that i think some kids some parents these days are more sensitive about than they were in yes. in the past and i think that's one of the reasons that they haven't shown it to their children but i do think that there is a way to update bambi and our our take on it was um did give a little bit more uh, of a of a scope to it and I just think that to be able to bring it to life for kids these days in a way that maybe they relate to a little bit more would would be of, of service to the original. Uh, Lord of the Flies. Yeah. I'm obsessed with uh, Luca. You're producing that movie. Yeah. What can you tease about what makes this movie his version of that story compared to any other interpretation maybe we've seen before? Oh, yeah. It, it, it's, it leans so much into psychological horror and um, it, it it's so rich in character drama as you would expect from somebody like him um but it's it's scary it's just like so unease it gives you so much unease reading it and i think it taps into a more current version of it than we we've seen before um just i think some people have tried to tackle that property in a way that doesn't really resonate to now and i just i think that the whole approach has been very fresh and refreshing I lie. I'll just ask my last one. Your Star Trek movie. Yeah. Is it is it still going forward? I feel like we it haven't is. heard anything about it in like a year. I, I don't. Yeah. I, it it is. It's still on the tracks. It's uh... <laughs> right answer again. <laughs> <laughs> it's um. I love that project, and it was another one that I had to hop off of to direct this movie. Um. And and that was a hard thing to do. But, I um, understand it, that. It was, uh, but I, I love that everybody involved with that project. That right there is the type of problem you should have to have, <laughs> where other opportunities come up and you have to let some others go. I yeah. have very high hopes. A lot of people out there are going to appreciate your spin on Pet Cemetery and exploring that corner that was underdeveloped before. And then also can't wait to see your Sleepy Hollow movie as well. Thank Congratulations. You so Thank you so much. And thanks for taking the time.